Um, all right, so for our next speaker, the great Jamie Dobson <laughs> will Hi. be talking about strategy in large programs. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah right. Thanks. Um, okay, so I know you guys are all hardcore techies. I don't know how long my run of talking about strategy can go on for, because for those of you who come regularly, this is not the first time you've seen me speak about this. Um, my recent work has been into strategy on large programs. So I've been lucky enough to be involved in a number of large technical programs, um, which included delivery, but also things like advertising campaigns, online campaigns. And programs are weird because they're smaller than running a business, but they're bigger than a software project. So it's basically what happens when you try to do something substantial, significant, and that your supply chain is made up of your own teams, but also suppliers, you know, and third parties, small and large. And basically, this is a set of guidelines or hur heuristics to survive large programs. Um, you might be thinking, what's this got to do with things like microservices, Metas, Docker, things like that. Any time you introduce a new technology, uh, it, it, will be, it will be and must be part of a larger strategic push. So I've seen automated testing uh, introduced to large organizations, and that was enough to you know, explode these places. Um, so when you start introducing things like programmable infrastructure, I guarantee two things. First of all, it will be hugely disruptive. And second of all, um, without a, a proper strategy implemented properly, you basically won't succeed. So that's where the overlap between um, uh, the technical work we do at Container Solutions and the sort of managerial work we do overlap. So we'll be looking at a few things, resources, paths, patience, uh, the strategies to storyteller before finally looking at these heuristics or these guidelines. I've got some notes with me, I'm not sure I'll need them, but let's just see. You don't need to wait to the end to shout any questions out, just, you know, holler. Um, okay, so without messing about, I've come to understand strategy as being about resources and specifically conflict resolution about such resources. So I googled resources, I found this was the first image, so I've put it in my slide deck. Because uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how else to visualize resources. 12 years ago, I was pretty lucky to be part of a really large program at KLM, the airline. And it was during, a, uh, just before actually the merger with Air France. KLM called it a merger, everybody else called it a takeover. Uh, and what, <laughs> and what, the <laughs> what, what the program was about was introducing online booking, online reservations, uh, and things like this. Now, we take all of that for granted, right? Because every airline does it, and in fact, many uh, uh, businesses provide web front ends to enable you to purchase their products. But actually, this was a massive deal back then. So as well as introducing uh, new products to their customers, who had been used to going to the travel agents, yeah, so this is another thing about that program. It, was the, it marked the death of most travel agents in the Netherlands, especially the KLM ones. So as well as exploring new technologies, new techniques, it was also integrated into a much larger uh, television advertising campaign uh, and things like this. So it was really strategic at every single level. Um, so if you think about it, what, were they, what resources were they resolving conflicts about? Well, the first one was the aeroplanes. They need to get as many people on the aeroplanes as possible. One way to do that is to have more efficient booking systems and more efficient systems for changing people's seats, right? If you could do that automatically. Um, the other thing, of course, was human resources costs. It's extremely expensive to run airlines, especially when your systems don't work. And airlines are one of the companies where if they have... Uh, one bad month, that's the difference between black and red. So again, any strategy that addressed those conflicts, you know, it was a good thing. But the story I want to tell was, is a story about a program manager and a middle manager. And the program manager took me aside one day and he was complaining and he said, you know, so-and-so just doesn't get it. And the conflict was about a group of freelancers or a group of uh, a, a development team that were being provided by a third party. And what the middle manager reasoned, what his logic was, was we pay you X amount of money per day. I want to see traction. I want to see traction even if that's just updates in a stand-up or every two weeks you show me progress with the software. The conflict was he was pissing everybody off. Uh, and maybe he was getting 
these superficial needs met, this need for constant progress, but the program itself was suffering because they were not coming up with any new ideas. And I didn't uh, know this at the time because I was maybe 10 or 12 years younger than I am now, but the program manager was smart. So he knew, first of all, all these large programs are strategic in nature. Now, and that's to say there's a real business problem, there's some analysis done, and the whole point of it is to move the business to a new state. That's what strategy is about. New states, analysis, and actions. So thinking and movement together. And because of this, you have to have space for thi to think, right? And one sure way to kill the space to think is to use something like stand-ups, reports, and basically low trust behavior, because then no new thinking takes hold. And you have to have new thinking if you want to have new states. So this led me to the conclusion then uh, that strategy is really all about conflicts about resources. Strategies themselves are about analyzing situations in order to resolve such conflicts. And the third thing is that's really important is strategy is about moving to a better state. Um, what happened to the middle manager? How was that conflict res was resolved? He was fired. And that's probably the most important lesson I've ever learned. Funnily enough, I didn't learn it back then. I only learned it recently. And I thought, oh yeah, he was right actually to get, get rid of that guy. Um, and that's because of something called emerging strategy. Now, I, I, I did have a diagram for this, but I've lost it. So I'm gonna have to use the whiteboard. Um, there's a guy called Henry Mintzberg, and he discovered an interesting uh, phenomena. And I'd be very curious if anybody has seen this on their own uh, programs or in their own companies or even on their projects, because this happens on a day-to-day -day basis, even in a small team. So you have a, a planned strategy. It looks something like this. Uh, what I said, a strategy is a lot of actions. Uh, and it joins with an emerging uh, st strategy in order to form the realized strategy. And of course, anything you plan to do that you didn't do is called unrealized. Um, uh, you know, it's like, where did these management consultants come up with this stuff? Uh, do you know why they're called gurus? Because charlatan's too hard to spell. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you like that, didn't you? <laughs> so this is uh, uh, emergent strategy. And I think if you think really hard, you must have seen this, where you, for example, wanted to do Spring. Oh, okay, back at KLM, we were using Spring, and somebody wanted to use Aspects for logging, right? And I was in charge of that team, and I said, no, you're not doing it. It's too risky. Aspects, regular expressions, you put Aspects on all the wrong things. You're not doing it. So I didn't really trust them, and it was new technology. And I... Uh, on the side of caution when I'm doing new tech. There's enough risk in these projects as it is. Anyway, what happens is I left, and then when I came back, this guy had taken over and they'd used aspects, and they'd used it really well. So even on a day-to-day -day basis, strategies emerge to solve problems in a new and better way. But people really, really badly misunderstand this model. They think, because it's called an emerging strategy, that it's an emergent property, but it's not. It's not an emergent property. You have to allow this to rise up. So if you put a load of barriers here, if you, if you focus on cost control at the wrong moment, making sure you know where the suppliers are, and essentially shutting down their space, the strategy will never emerge. And what you'll be left with is the realized strategy minus the unrealized strategy. So something that's not really compelling. That's not really solving the business problem at hand. So the absolute lesson here is that the strategy has to be allowed to emerge, and for that, you need space. Sometimes you can draw a donut. You know, how big should your core activities be, and how much space should be left for people to grow into? So, more formally, all strategies follow the innovation process. And I remember earlier I said strategies about new things, 
That's why they follow the innovation pro process. If it was just about doing something that was well known, you wouldn't need strategy, you could just plan. Right? That's the difference between planning and strategies. Planning is just doing known actions in a timely manner. Strategies are when there's somebody out there deliberately trying to get in the way of what you're doing. At the biggest level, other airlines were competing with KLM. At the smallest level, the middle manager, deliberately or otherwise, was interfering with the work of the program manager. So a strategy is always when there's another being or entity deliberately trying to trip you up. Mike Tyson had it right. He said, everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Strategies are about dealing with getting punched in the face. Uh, so the way it works, the way it should work, is in the beginning of a program, lots of ideas need to bloom. That's, these are represented by these dots. Ideas that must be seen to fruition. So it's the things we try and reject. Try and reject. What tends to happen is after a while, a path starts to emerge. Round about here, this is what I call the middle of your program. And I even say that to people, welcome to the middle of your program or the middle of your project. Because then things start to sort of emerge and we have an idea about where we're going. Then you can start to do planning and release schedules. It would be pretty stupid, in my opinion, if you've got a multi-million dollar program and you start planning your advertising schedule here. That would be stupid because if you've done the adverts and then the software's not ready, you've just wasted all your money, right? So this is the area of schedules and this is the area of experimentation. Most people understand one area but not both at the same time. And that actually is a clue to a good strategist, a good human being actually, Anybody who can hold competing ideas in the brain at the same time and not go crazy, right? So often we plan or often we experiment because it's the easiest thing to do. And the hardest thing is to experiment sometimes and plan uh, in other times. So the middle of your program is somewhere, uh, oops, sorry, I went forward too early. It's somewhere in there. And what's interesting is how do you know how can you possibly know if you're in the middle of the program? Uh, well, you can't, right? That's about judgment. So industrialness, industriousness, you know, hard work, uh, is if you were always industrious, you would pick fruit off the tree before it was ripe. But if you were always conscientious and spent too much time nurturing things, by the time you got to the fruit, it would be ruined. So knowing when to pick fruit requires judgment. Succeeding with any project or any large program requires judgment, w knowing when you've experimented enough and you're ready to begin to commit. The middle of the program is like being on a roller coaster. And you can't quite see the top, maybe you're in the middle seats. So you know, dang, 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 dang. You're going up, up, up and up. So you know you might be getting to the middle of the program because you've been doing that up, up, up bit for ages. The people ahead of you might already see that the second half of the project is about to start because they'll be screaming. Screaming with laughter and fear, like what's gonna happen? And then of course the roller coaster starts and at some undefined moment, everybody realizes they're in the second half of the program. The roller coaster's off. And it's typified by fun. This is the best part to be in because this, there's no relationship between cause and effect or it's very loose. This is a time of uncertainty, of change, of trusting yourself. The second half of the program, if you did the first half of the program well, if you didn't, this won't happen. The second half of the program is typified by a widening gap between, uh, have I got this right? Oh no, I've got this wrong. <laughs> uh, sorry? Oh yes, sure. Um, a red one. Um, maybe this is right. This would be typified. Is that a bit better? You can't see that from there. Right. Doesn't matter. I can right. I can play charades. I use my hands. <laughs> the the difference in in the second half of the program between the cost of things and the value they deliver will be ever widening. Right. So you'll just make small changes to release new features. The advertisement campaign will go live and bam, you get thousands and millions of you know, requests on your website. So if you've done your experimentation well, 
The second half of the program is like a roller coaster. There is something you should be aware of about the second half of the program, and it's the same for even small projects, is you have to be aggressive. So once you know where you're going, you have to pursue these things aggressively. Um, Netflix is a good example. They had, you know, you could order DVDs through the post and they had a streaming service. Those are essentially two options. They chose one option to focus on streaming and then they pursued it extremely aggressively, right? And that's the funny thing. You go to large companies where these large programs are and people are aggressive at the wrong moments. They're aggressive in meetings when they're trying to get their own way and they're passive when they need to be aggressively finding out whether these experiments worked. So it's all about judgment, really. Um, this is a drawing we've been working on. The beginning of the program is about cultivation. It's about long-term cultivation versus short-term intervention. You've got to be patient. If you use the metaphor of a gardener, most people think, yeah, 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 that's, yeah I'm a gardener, I'm a cultivator. But if you use your powers of observation, most people are like that. <coughs> they actually think they can make things go faster by pulling on them. Saying to a developer, are you done yet? Can you skip your tests? Whoa, whoa. Right, this type of pressure is not conducive to long-term cultivation, long-term success. What do you do? Um, some people you, you have to fire. Uh, being a strategist is hard enough. Trying to design these large programs is hard enough. But you've also got to deal with other people. And we talk about at Container Solutions, we talk about timid ignorance. So timid ignorance is the type of ignorance that people uh, uh, is reflected in what they say and how they act. It's always a reflection of fear. So timid ignorance comes in three uh, three forms: jeopardy, uh, perversion, and futility. Some people will say, in response to an idea, "Oh, we shouldn't do that because we're going to jeopardize all the good work we've done." That sounds logical. Nobody wants to jeopardize all the hard work we've done. That's timid ignorance. You've got to learn to ignore that. Perversity. Oh, we shouldn't do that. It'll put things in danger. It won't work in production. That's too risky. Right? That's perverse. That, that what they're trying to say is that your ideas and your, uh, your plans for moving forward will have the opposite effect. Futility. That will never work, full stop. At first glance, when you, a colleague shows timid ignorance, you listen to them because it's in it's human nature to respect people. But actually, you can often be surrounded by naysayers, people who basically will stop any movement. But I just said that without movement, you get no cultivation, and without cultivation, you get no emerging path. Fire naysayers. That was the lesson I learned from that program manager. You've got to fire them. Um, if you want to move quickly, and if you want to succeed, remove negative people. Uh, unfortunately, we're all prone to timidity, if that's even a word. <laughs> and you can't fire everybody. If we had an infinite supply of great people, you could just you know, select your own team. So this brings into another uh, uh, component of the strategist, which is this. Strategist has to be able to articulate, has to be able to do storytelling in order to present the current state of affairs, what he, th he or she thinks, and typically, strategist talks to a group of people. They then give feedback, you know, so understanding of the problem grows, as does the analysis. And if there's a click between the people the strategist is representing, the revolutionaries, I call them, uh, then a coalition starts to build, a willing coalition, the people who are going to actually do this work. And then together, we move forward to the new state. This is a pretty important skill for a tech lead, strategist, CTO, CEO, right? Because through storytelling, you start to give people purpose. What are we doing here? Why are we doing it? So it's really very important that the storytelling occurs all the time. I said earlier that autonomy was absolutely key for everybody. You need space to do new things. You need space to think. Now, what people are mastering <coughs> That's something that I'm not going to talk about now, but a good strategist would at very least take, take, take care of purpose and autonomy, and these are the three things that make up highly motivated individuals. 
and highly motivated individuals bring programs in and low motivated individuals bring nothing in. So again, using your judgment, fire the naysayers, fire the, the people you need to fire uh, and motivate the ones who are left. So that brings me to my heuristics, the sort of rules I think we can use to um, survive large programs or anything that's a bit strategic. First one, if it wasn't obvious, fire people. Uh, and I favour overzealousness over underzealousness, right? It's better to be wrong than sorry. Uh, find your generals. So in relation to firing people, uh, some people you work better with at arm's length. So the first part of the programme, going back to this, should also be about finding where your suppliers are. Have you got suppliers you can work with on a daily basis? Or do you need to work with them in a wider orbit? So believe it or not, we work with people very effectively, but at arm's length. Some of my partners I only speak to twice a year. And that works for them, and it works for us. So it's about finding your orbits, getting people in the right positions. This is known as a strategy map. It's a visualization of activities, current states, future states. It's worth noting it's a square. It's framed. So strategy is mu as much about, you know, when you frame, you take away, right? If you take a picture of a landscape, you do this, you only get what's in, in shot. The first half of your program, when you drop in options, is about taking stuff away. It's about what you're not going to do. A structure is your friend. Any program worth its salt is, a str is structured. So at least give yourself a chance to come together regularly. Uh, the Agile methods take this to an extreme, too far extreme. But meeting regularly is something that's very important. Uh, second half, watch out for the second half. That's the most fun, right? Learn how to judge when momentum shifts. SFA, stop fucking around. Uh, Marcus Aurelius said, the impediment to an action advances action. Uh, what stands in the way becomes the way. Most strategies and programs just sort of muddle on because people are just messing around, drinking too much coffee, complaining about their bosses. Uh, that can be chazelic, but you won't, you won't do anything creative. Um, CTFD, calm the fuck down. Um, your brain is horrible. Your brain is really not a very nice thing. It focuses on negatives by design, right? So literally, things look worse than they are. Usually, that wouldn't matter. Okay, things look worse than they are, never mind. The, but the problem is, if you're pessimistic, you don't take actions. And if you don't take actions, you don't move through the design space, and therefore, you get nothing done. So you've somehow got to learn to suppress your instincts to view everything as dark and black. That's even worse for engineers because we're trained to see things that are broken. It's harder for lawyers. Lawyers are the most unhappy people, uh, like I think statistically, more divorces and all of that. And it's because they're trained to not trust other people. right? They're trained to look for sneaky things. So those are my heuristics, right? Fire people, don't mess around, uh, don't waste your time, visualise strategy maps. Then there's this is question, does this shit actually really work? Does any of this work? Um, I, I think it does. I wanted to give three examples. So the first one was uh, IoT. So back in the summer, this was just a rough idea that we had at Container Solutions. We thought it was worth pursuing, so it was an option we wanted to explore. That starts off very cheaply, putting aside uh, half a day to talk about it, to plan, to sketch. And then we ask ourselves, oh, is this working? Is this something we, that's worth pursuing? Yeah, okay. So we move to prototype stage. I believe you're going to be seeing the prototype later. That costs a few thousand euros, right? 5,000 euros. Can I live with that? What's the downside? What's the potential upside? Okay, we can do a pro proof of concept. Then it looked like it was working. And then we switched from experimentation to ex aggressive, really aggressive execution. So we took the IoT stuff to DockerCon, and it worked really well. Now, it just so happened that the IoT stuff was on the side, but we're doing a really big project with Cisco, and it turns out that IoT and the work we're doing there is a perfect match. And so we brought them together, and we're pretty happy with how that's going. Elasticsearch framework, uh, it started off as an idea, as a thought experiment. 
Thinking is free. People forget that. Thinking is free. It doesn't cost anything. You can do it on your bike. Uh, some people are so scared because the brain is a bastard, they see things so black, they don't even have time to think, right? You get very myopic when you're scared. So this started off as an idea with Frank. Hey, what would happen if you put uh, elastic on muscles? We talked about it, we messed about. Then it came back again. Hey, let's do a proof of concept. Then again, another customer was interested and we switched from experimentation to aggressive implementation. And that went to market like uh, a few weeks ago, the beta version. So all of this happened in the space of a few months. The pattern's always the same. What's the upside? What's the downside? Is it working? Aggression. For everything that works, there's five or six things that can tell the solutions that we've thrown away. However, you don't ever really throw things away. They go in a big bucket. And later on, they happen to come back out and you're like, oh, we did that earlier this year, right? So blogs, code, snippets, ideas, they all go in a massive bucket and that shit always comes back out. Software Circus was a conference. You know about Software Circus because you're at the Software Circus meetup. Uh, at first, we had the idea, again, imagination, should we have a technologically agnostic conference? Should it be fun? We did these meetups. Okay, that seemed to be working. Let's do a conference. We might learn a lot. What's the downside? What's the upside? Okay, it's, this is a big downside. It's going to cost about 100,000 euros. Can we live with that? Have we got it? Can we get it? Uh, once a decision was made, aggressive execution, and from the idea to the delivery of the keynote was 11 weeks. Uh, and in the end, we got a new brand, a brand new community. And last I heard, it's going to San Francisco, it's going to London, uh, and people are praising it for being the anti-conference. So I think optionality works. I think thinking strategically about your technical products works. Uh, but I think strategic strategy and thinking strategically is more than reading bullshit management books. You'd be better off reading uh, philosophy. It's nothing more than thinking about things and taking actions in order to see the next potential actions. And that can happen on a small scale, on a Java project, a medium scale, or a larger scale. And that was my experience with strategy on a... Uh, Large projects, and that's it. I'm finished. <laughs> Any questions? Well, yeah. Do you want to speak into the mic so the stream can hear? Hello, stream live streamers. Uh, so sorry, I am not. Uh, like in the context a bit about that IoT. Can you please explain what that is just for people who are first time here? What IoT is or how we build uh, that? What's, uh, wh whatever context you find uh, okay, reasonable yeah, to give. All right, cool, good question. So the question was about IoT. Maybe some people here in the room or on the stream don't know what that is. So IoT is Internet of Things and that's basically lots of small devices sending data back to a server or a data farm. So some of the uses of IoT are very practical. I think I spoke to a company the other week that were working, uh, helping to ships to find a berth. So you could have a device on the berth and a device on the ship, and they would match the two up. Apparently this is a problem when you come into a port. The Another very interesting IoT project we looked at was a, a type of sensor that goes inside the uh, bra, and it measures the temperature of breast tissue. Now, it's reasonably comfortable to wear. You don't really know it's there. And it has low energy, so you don't need a battery. And it sends signals uh, to a central uh, server. However, changes in temperature are early indications of different forms of cancer. So what you do is collect all the data, and then you run an algorithm on it, and basically alert people preemptively if they're having problems. So. Although our Internet of Things stuff has been a bit of fun, we actually have got really big ideas for its application. And what we are at CS, we're experts in uh, containerized systems, and we're learning how to put IoT and containers together so we can come up with some value-adding uh, products and ideas. Is that okay, do you think? <laughs> has everybody heard of IoT? Yeah, of Yeah, of course. <laughs> I spoke with specific devices the other day about here on a 
this this was our first prototype. So we, we started off with the idea and then we sort of ch chatted and I think we bought a load of stuff on the internet and put it together and then we put the logo on. First thing we did, it doesn't work but it's got a logo and we ex sort of experimented with it and I think we found out can we connect it to the computer? Does it generate what data does it generate? Can we connect it to an endpoint? We we are all software guys here, so this was like you know, actually we're streaming. I won't say what it was like, uh, but this was not the most elegant engineering. But we you know we cobble stuff together and in Why the progress. Why thank you, Jamie? Yeah, well, <laughs> Remel was involved in that project. Yeah, uh, maybe not the most elegant process, but you know we learned a few things along the way, and then later we started to attach sensors to things. So we were simulating like for example the temperature reading and then we started to do uh, think about analytics on that so this was the first prototype i don't want to spo spoil rembolt's talk later he will to explain this in more details any more um you mentioned that we should read more uh, philosophy yeah. you mentioned minsberg i believe do you have minsberg yeah yeah you have more concrete uh, well, sources to read, to... to so, yeah, sure. Uh, Minsberg was a management type fella. His books are okay, but they're a bit dense, but this idea uh, is mind-blowing. So people think about strategy, and in the case studies, they always give, they always say, oh, IKEA, perfectly designed. It has a unique proposition, a unique distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And that makes the reader think that this was planned, right? But the truth is, back in the day, the Swedish government changed the VAT rules. And all the Swedish people wanted to spend all the money as quickly as possible before the rule changed. I think the Swedish are a bit like the Dutch. Right? So they, they bought loads of furniture and IKEA couldn't fulfill the demand from their warehouses. So what they did is said, please come to our warehouses and pick up your own furniture. Right? Okay. That's how come IKEA shops look like warehouses. Then... Uh, the, the IKEA people were a bit, felt a bit bad because like, shit, all these people are starving. Let's give them meatball and chips. And that's why you get meatball and chips at IKEA. <laughs> fact, absolute fact. All of these events happened at different stages. There was a conspiracy against fine Swedish furniture, uh, not connoisseurs, but tradesmen against IKEA. So the guy who created IKEA outsourced his work to Poland, but then he couldn't get the stuff back. So they, they d designed these flat packs. Right? So all this guy kept doing is he had a very good nose for what was working. And over a series of a very long time and experimentation, he was able to produce uh, this great strategy that's yet to be beaten. It was not planned. Strategy cannot and will never be planned. Okay, in terms of philosophy, stoicism is the closest thing you'll get to a handbook for surviving tech. And the guy to go to is Marcus Aurelius. So his meditations book, it's like getting told off every night. I mean, I've got stress. I'm the CEO of a company, and I don't know. Uh, failure and success look very similar. Uh, and, and taking 100,000 euro bets on conferences is quite scary. Marcus Aurelius, you just go to bed, and you're all full of anxiety. And then it re you read the book, and it says things like, some people survive the death of a child. Your job is to stand up, not be held up. OK, good advice. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> so then you close it and you feel a bit better. Uh, and Marcus Aurelius says all kinds of stuff about not giving in to temptations, but there's general stoic thought all the way through, uh, uh, you know, the last couple of cent uh, millennia. Frederick Nietzsche, I was quoting him earlier, conscientiousness versus industrialness, that comes up in his books. But the Dutch are genuinely, genuinely quite stoic people anyway, so you're in good uh, um, company. But don't let anybody convince you they've been Stoics when actually they've been fatalistic. But you're Dutch and it takes one to spot one, so I think you'll be all right. <laughs> uh, any more? Sorry, for the microphone, for the stream. Sorry. Um, any strategy if you're actually ahead of this upcoming uh, wave and you are not the program manager? you have to fight with this guy like on a on a horizontal line yeah. so what to do in this case <laughs> take a deep breath okay which line are you on this one yeah the upcoming like ongoing yeah and you you you've got an idea and you're convinced it's good and the guy on the horizontal is blocking you yes. 
Right, what do you do? What are the strategies? Well, let's go through the strategic cycle. So first thing you need to do is uh, articulate what you think the better solution is to him, her, or as many people as you can. Listen to the response. Try to understand what's going on. Try to understand their analysis, right? What's, his, what's this person's desire? Is he blocking you because he's diligent? Is he blocking you because your failure will be his successes in a later program? What is he doing? Get to know him. What are his needs, right? If he hates you, get him to do, get him to do you a favour. Because when somebody helps you, they then have to justify it to themselves. So although he hates you, after he's helped you, he'll be going, oh, he's not so bad, that guy. <laughs> you know, he's, he was doing that thing with Java. And yeah, he's all right. Uh, and then think if you can design the future together. It helps if you can explain all this stuff, right? Alternatively, you might have to be patient and s explain all of this to him and say, you know what? You do it your way first. Let's experiment and see what works. And then we'll do it my way. You promise, scouts honor, you say to him. But a lot of it's about communication and learning to get what you want. Uh, I hate politics. I really hate politics because when you, sp you know, SFA, stop fucking around. When you're doing politics, you're not creating. But a bit of p positive politics every now and then. Rah. And if he's a dick, let him hang himself. <laughs> he'll go. If your program manager is good, he'll fire him. If your program manager doesn't spot that, you go. Walk with your feet. Or vote with your walk with your feet. What else would you walk with? <laughs> vote with your feet. Um, but you've got to be thinking. You've got to you've got to come to work every day and think. Right, how am I gonna uh, deal with this? And by the way, it doesn't matter how high up you go, you'll face exactly the same problems. So at KLM, I was a low level pleb, just a pleb. Uh, I had six or seven people um, working for me in my team, and. They said performance testing couldn't be done, agile performance testing specifically because of feedback loops and they hate us. And I managed to form a coalition of people to do this. I ended up writing a paper about it. I may have even been the first person to write about agile performance testing. Uh, despite what my bosses thought, I just, whatever. And I didn't realize I was being strategic. I just thought I was doing my job. Now I'm the CEO of Container Solutions. You think, oh, my life would be easier because obviously there's nobody above me. But there are people above me, shareholders, customers, bigger fish, right? So it doesn't matter where you are, this coalition building and communication is totally necessary. And rather than moaning about it, which is what most developers do, <laughs> you've got to work on those skills to uh, get better at it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Any more? I think I saw a hand here. Hold on. Um, I, get, I guess the... Um, you were kind of putting down negativity in a sense, um, yeah. And you were t putting down the voices that say no, 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 be and like the cautious voices. Do it, and I guess I get why because we're a bunch of cautious programmers. Yeah. But do you ever think there's a place for those kind of things? Yeah, yeah, I do actually. That's a, yeah, that's a good question. That wasn't a broad, um, uh, a broad attack on criti critique or criticism, which should be welcomed, but it was an attack on uh, that that term I used. Uh, timid ignorance. So when it's fear-driven um, uh, language and behavior, I think you should put a stop to it. But if somebody can critique an idea, shake it to death, and that's something we do at CS quite a bit, uh, and then have a move it to the side or try with an experiment, then I think that's totally fine. Yeah, yeah. So if I've, if I've said that wrong, I apologize, because criticism is a really important part of creation. And when you do the analysis, you're essentially critiquing what, what you see right in front of you. Uh, so being critical is not the same as being negative. Yeah. Uh, but good critical people will be, can be critical and supportive. Mm -hmm. So the, the it's full of paradox. So if somebody's critical and negative, it's probably a dick, <laughs> right? Uh, but if people are critical and supportive, aggressive and compassionate, then you know you, you're moving somewhere. So it's full of paradoxes. When do you, when do you move? When do you stick? And, and resolving those paradoxes is, is why software, even in the worst environments, can be fully uplifting, really uplifting. Um. Cool.